So we are informal. If you haven't been to a teaching tree session before, we're, we're very informal. If you've got a question, just shout it out. If you've got a contribution, shout it out too. We want to hear what everybody has to say. And if you have a teaching tree pun, also shout that out. Do not shout out puns. Puns, yes. All right, so um, the first question is, what is screencasting? I, I don't know if everybody is familiar with the term, but screencasting is the idea that you record, and <laughs> I'll leave Rachel out of the puns, thanks Kelly. Screencasting is the idea that you will record whatever is happening on your computer screen, and you'll add your explanation with your voice to the recording. So you're doing a screencasting and it can be really simple types of things. It can become something that's really sophisticated and multimedia information rich type of presentation. So there's, there's a whole range of screencasting and we're not expecting anybody to become an expert and be like, hey, I'm gonna use Adobe Premiere or Camtasia Studio and make this perfect. So we'll, we'll give you the how to get started and sort of some tips of how we might use it. Um, so the why, we talked about learning styles being different, providing materials in multiple modalities, which can increase student learning and engagement. Um, and if a picture is worth a thousand words, what is a video worth? So um, this kind of really opened up my mind to consider uh, how video, uh, screencasting is going to be improved in, in terms of just doing um, regular audio or video or, or using Canvas to do that. Um, there's a couple things that we're going to discuss on how Tasha uses it that might be different than the way I use it in my courses and some new exciting ways that we might try it for fall semester. And then um, we listed some different purposes. So we highlighted explaining difficult technical concepts, reviewing lesson content, um, doing like weekly announcements, presenting online lectures, uh, providing feedback, which um, I've talked about a few times in the past how I use Canvas to do um, video feedback, but they're just seeing my face, which students say, oh, we love video, video feedback, um, but I actually haven't really been utilizing um, doing that with screencasting where I can actually show the assignment, especially for visual assignments where I can highlight different things that the student did, kind of talk about what worked, what didn't, um, and give them direct feedback in relation to what we're looking at. So I feel like that's taking it to the next level. So that's something that I'm going to be adding to um, my fall courses. And then uh, professional development and assessing students, having them explain. And so I just wanted to touch on this as well, because this is where Tasha said she uses it in her course. So she can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but it's something I've never tried. I've never suggested that students do screencasting and walk through the process of maybe how they created an assignment in my class, um, what they were thinking, uh, why they you know, chose certain graphics that they did, what information that they chose. Um, and I really like the idea of getting in their heads and understanding how they created this how they interpreted the instructions and what they produced as a result. Um, so Tasha, I don't know if you want to touch on a little bit more of how you use that in your courses. Yeah, I, I got tired of writing tests and trying to come up with something that was original and that wouldn't be out there on the internet already. And I also got tired of seeing students not perform well on exams when I knew from interacting with them and working with them that they actually did know the material. So I wanted to come up with a more authentic assessment. And the one that I came up with, it was not my original idea, but it was to have students explain the concepts. And so I have students screencast. Now with computer science, it really makes sense to do screencasts because they can share their code in the video. They can show how the code runs, right? And they can explain the different concepts. And it's good not just for them to explain to me, but they share their videos with each other and they learn from each other. So screencasting doesn't have to be something that you are making a recording of. It can be that your students are doing the recording, right? Have them do some of the work and that gets some of that student to student interaction, especially in an asynchronous course. And students feel like they get to know each other. And I actually hear from students, oh, I'm always waiting for you know, such and such student to uh, post their explanation video because it makes so much more sense when they explain it. And I just want to add one other thing is um, this could be another way for students to even understand their assignments and to explain it to each other. It's another way for them to be learning, um, which again is something I had not considered before. So I think that's really exciting opportunity for them um, to try it out on their own to kind of um, be able to practice with making videos 
uh, and see how they progress through the semester as well, because I'm, I'm guessing it might evolve and kind of change with how they go through that process um, and respond to each other as well, like you said in the discussion boards. Do any of you use screencasting in different ways that we didn't suggest? Can you go back one? Oh, I was going to say professional development's on there. That was going to be mine. Using them for faculty students. I so I thought that. of I thought of one more, which is giving a course tour. Right? We didn't put that on the slide. Oh, but a course tour. Yeah. Give students a course tour. Help them figure out where to find things in Canvas. And that's something that doesn't work as well in a written form or just an audio form. But with a screencast, it'll work really well because they can see exactly where you're going. Maybe also assignment instructions, which probably feels a little bit like a reviewing lesson content or difficult concepts. It's in there somewhere, but yeah, kind of showing them a process of what they have to do for an assignment. I like that also because I, I provide some student examples in my some of my visual assignments, but I feel like students just look at it and they kind of miss exactly why I shared that. Ah. Um, so I feel like that would be like, okay, here's my opportunity to call these things out and really point out, you know, why this student's example was what I chose to share with the class for them to, to better understand how to put everything together. So I like that idea as well. I haven't tried that for instructions. That's a great idea. You could link it to the rubric too. Ooh. <laughs> Level up. Okay, yeah. right now. <laughs> so for key takeaways, um, student-centered and engaging learning experience in a both distal, distance and traditional learning setting. Uh, keep videos short, uh, which I really like, thinking about um, just five minutes or less. Uh, it doesn't have to be something long, like 30 minutes. I also wanted to note that the longer the video, the more pressure it is on you to kind of make sure that you're you know, discussing the, whatever content you want to share. Um, that you're not making mistakes and feeling kind of flustered by that. So keeping them little bite size, it's easier for recording them, but it's also going to be easier for students to digest that. If they're not sitting down having to work, watch something that's 30 minutes long, they can watch little segments uh, depending on what you're sharing, and it'll probably increase the chances of them watching it in completion. Plus with a short video, you can suggest to students that, hey, you know, when you find you've got 10 minutes here or there, watch a few videos for class, learn something in that little bit of time. And that makes the course feel a little bit more approachable than, wow, I'm supposed to be spending, you know, six to 12 or more hours per week on this course. Like, when can I possibly find all that time? That's a great point. Um, and then creating your own screencasts ensures alignment with lesson objectives, goals, assessment practices, and standards. And that comes back to Katie's point, if, if you do your instructions in this format as well, it's all gonna be aligned and easier for students to understand. Um, and then Tasha put imperfect is perfect, which really rings so true to me. I'm a perfectionist. Um, we didn't even like really practice this presentation. I'm used to really like who's talking when. Um, I like structure and kind of the winging it is not really my strong suit. So I got excited to be like, okay, let's, let's try this out and see how I can you know, navigate that. Um, so when she put that in, I was like, okay, when I do my videos, often I'll re-record them because I make, you know, an error and I kind of fumble and I'm like, oh, I don't want students to see that. So I end up recording it two or three times, which takes a lot of time and makes me feel overwhelmed with my workload. So I'm going to approach this that, hey, be my authentic self, show them, you know, the best that I can do and then move on to the next thing and not get too caught up in it. So I did want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and the imperfect is perfect is Katie's saying. And Katie, thank you so much for starting to share that with us. Um, it can be really intimidating when you first start making videos. And my students all say that about the videos I require them to make as well. They say, it's, I'm really nervous about making it. And I say, you know, that's okay. I was really nervous when I first started making some videos also. And sometimes I do hit record a few times because I just feel like I'm stumbling over my own tongue while talking. But after a while, after you've made a bunch of them, you start to say, you know what, if there's a little mistake, who cares? I'm just gonna make a correction and move on, right? It's the same thing that you would do in class. So pretend that you're in the classroom talking to your students in a place where you feel comfortable and just talk to students that way. And then it feels more approachable and warm as well. I was gonna say with the perfect, imperfect is perfect, the 
that has been like so helpful in creating the videos. And then the only ones that I feel like I have to spend a lot of perfecting time on are like for final projects or final assignments that I want to be really clear with instructions. So it's nice to kind of have that time to focus on what I call like the important and succinct videos versus just kind of explaining concepts or helping think through some problems that I've been having or some problems they've been having that I that I want to show them how to work through. Great advice. Do you want to take this one? Uh, so there's there's a few options for getting started with screen uh, casting. The easiest one is going to be using Canvas Studio, right? It's integrated into Canvas. It's really easy to use. It's got some decent auto captioning so that you can spend a minimal amount of time um, adjusting your captions. It's completely integrated into Canvas. It hosts the video, right? And it's like this one-stop shop. You hit record, you record it, and you say uh, you you uh, publish it, you get your captions published, and you put a link to it in your Canvas course, right? Pretty simple. Um, and students can use it too. There are other options. There's Screencast-O-Matic. Um, Canvas Studio uses the same screen capture software that Screencast-O-Matic does, but if you would prefer to use Screencast-O-Matic, you can do that. There's a free version that has some limitations or you can get the paid version. Um, if you're CTE and you're interested in a paid version of Screencast-O-Matic, you should talk to Monica about that. Um, there's also OBS Studio, which is um, free. It's um, open source uh, screencasting type of thing. It's a little bit more complex to set up, but it can be incredibly powerful if you want to take the time to learn how to use it. There's a bunch of tutorials out there. Um, if you're just getting started and you're happy to just say, hey, I'm just going to grab this capture and I don't want anything particularly fancy in it, Try Canvas Studio first, though. Um, with OBS Studio or Screencast-O-Matic, you could upload your videos to Canvas Studio for hosting, or you can also post your videos on YouTube for hosting. And YouTube does have fairly decent auto captioning as well. Can I, what is can I share something here? Sure. And I'm, I'm not sure what the next slide is, but um, <clears throat> as someone who used Screencast-O-Matic for a really long time, I haven't, I'm finding that it's hard to, to use both Screencast-O-Matic and Canvas Studio. Um, you kind of have to go all in with one or all in with the other. And um, because of the fact that it's the same software, it kind of conflicts when you have Screencast-O-Matic installed on your computer and then you go to Canvas Studio, it tries to install it locally, you'll get an error. And so I find myself as somebody who's like, was full of a Screencast-O-Matic prior to, I actually don't use Canvas Studio tons just because I'm having to uninstall, reinstall, and then I wanna do screencast -O So anyway, um, if you're new to it, kind of just choose one without necessarily feeling like you have to shop around to all of them, I guess, because especially with those two, they're the same product, just kind of slightly different um, deliveries of the product, I guess. Good synopsis. So uh, we've got some time if you want to ask some questions. Otherwise, um, we'll send you to your seedling assignment to either um, record a short Canvas tour. And we've got a link in the slides. Uh, we'll stick a link in the chat to the slide so you can uh, click on that link to a sample course navigation script that we found at some other website, some other institution's website. Um, or maybe you want to create a five minute mini lecture about a concept that your students are struggling with right now. It's right? something that you can you know, post today or post Monday and, and it's useful to you. We want you to get something useful out of this. Um, and we thought that we'd do some breakout rooms that we could have one where we'll help people who want some help with Canvas Studio. And we'll have another breakout room where you're ready to record. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about what it is that you're going to record and that type of thing. But before we go to breakout rooms, are there any questions? Candace? I, I just have uh, I, I just have a quick question for for Katie. Um, just your last point about the the two um, formats conflicting um, because I, I did screencast-o-matic that's what I did back with Blackboard and I haven't transitioned to Canvas Studio, but I think I want to. Um, so do, so are you saying I need to uninstall something 
first or is that a suggestion that I that I heard in that yes and so you can try how might can, I do that <laughs> yeah you can try running canvas studio just as is on your machine but I anticipate that you'll likely get an error that says something like this is already running or I can't remember what it says so then you I think I your, think I've had that yeah yeah so then you have to go to your programs and uninstall and I have a I have a page that shows you the screenshot of what where to go to uninstall are you on a windows machine pc I'm on a mac you're on a Mac. Okay. So then we'll have to come up with another screenshot for you, but you don't, you don't have to, if you even just send me that, I'm sure that will, will help enough to okay. just give me an idea. Cause I've uninstalled things. I just, um, so even if I have like an idea of it, yes. I can probably figure it out. Yeah. And then the next time after you've uninstalled it, the next time that you run canvas studio, it'll, it'll flow beautifully without that error. Um, so yeah, that, that, and then you can kind of decide if you want to keep using Canvas Studio or you can always switch back to Screencast o matic too. It's just that it's on the fly, which I tend to do the recording kind of on the fly. It's harder to do to do the, all of those steps on the fly, right? So that's where I was at. Hopefully that clears it up a little. I think I ran into that issue like, um, hmm. cause I had screencast o matic on and then I was using Canvas Studio and actually it worked at first, but then I think screencast o matic um, I should say Canvas Studio, I think they upgraded the version they were using and then the, the versions were mismatched and that was horrible. Um, and so I had to do the uninstall. And the only thing that that um, kind of was like a hang up for me with the uninstall is I was looking for the wrong program name. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to find the right program name. It's like, I, I forgot what it's called. It's like web capture or something. It's, it's not called, what I, think I was. It's screen recorder launcher or something like that. It's something that's a little bit more generic. Yeah, that was like the, it took me, I actually had to Google how to like uninstall Screencast-O-Matic to like figure out what the right one was. So mm -hmm. anyway, not that that's helpful, but my experience with it. <laughs> no, it is helpful. Thank you. Well, it's helpful to know that that was an issue because I think that when I first tried Canvas, I got frustrated because I couldn't figure out what was happening. And then I never went back to it, even though everybody's been raving about Canvas Studio. So I'm glad to know that maybe I just need to uninstall. I have a question before we move to breakout rooms, so and maybe it's a better question for a breakout room. But um, does anyone... That so I primarily use screencast o matic and I like haven't gone. Does anyone do like advanced stuff in the screen recording, just like zooming in on an area? Like, I don't want to go crazy and add in like I'm not like a in YouTube influencer, but there's sometimes that like I would like to zoom in on the, the buttons I want them to push or like highlight something. And I haven't spent any time doing that. So I'm wondering if anyone has and has any advice, but I'm getting, it looks like I'm getting a lot of like mm, basic edit. Yeah. Like adding images. I've done that or like adding pop-ups for like definition or like the word I'm talking about, but. Are you doing that in screencast o matic Rachel? Yeah. Well, I'd love to, that's the software I use. Yeah. So you have the pro. Yes, through CTE. Yeah, so you can. Actually, I've been pretty impressed with that, with that software, because I was used to using Camtasia for making, for adding all of the pop-outs and stuff like that, fancy stuff. And like for a much, because the price point is so much cheaper, I wasn't expecting Canva, uh, Screencast-O-Matic to be that great. But it's actually, you can do a lot of editing in Screencast-O-Matic. Is it, and it's, and, and just to, for the, like if I want to zoom in on something, that's all done post Right. Yes. You're not doing it during the video. Okay. Yes. Okay. Correct. Cause I felt like I was trying to do stuff during the video. I'm like, I don't know where I need this. Is. <laughs> no, no, no. You record. That. And then after you record, you hit edit. And then in okay. editing, you get all of the drawing, zooming, yeah. cutting and pasting tools. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, they actually have some really, they have really good tutorials for screencast matic So let me go grab a couple of those. Uh, things. Yeah. I haven't. Okay. Yet. I haven't had time, you know, cause it's like things like I want to do this and I would like to add in these zooms, but I haven't had time. So well, and also it's like, do you want to like invest the time of figuring out if it can do exactly what yeah. you want it to do? And the good news is, is I think it probably will. I yeah. think, I mean, from what I've, I've played with it a little bit and like, sometimes I'll do that instead of booting up Camtasia studio. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank I, you. Has I'm, anybody played around with like, cause I, I use the um, draw tools in Canvas studio, but you have to do it in real time. 
And the thing that just drives me crazy is I think you actually have to stop recording, turn on the tools, then you can, you can do whatever you could draw, you can put text or whatever. And then you have to stop recording to take the tools off. Cause like the, like, it, I think it like freezes the frame, right? Has anybody else played with those? I've had I, a lot of trouble with them, the drawing tools. I haven't because I haven't played with studio, but I will say that when I need to record something where I want to draw on my screen, I open up Zoom and pretend I'm sharing my screen and use the annotation tools from Zoom. And then I just screen the cap that. Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 or I you will use something else, but yeah, if I'm just annotating on top of like a website, I'm like, I pull up Zoom, even though that's not what I'm recording in to use its annotation tools and that, pretend I, that I'm writing on something. Cause I've had problems with Zoom. Um, if I have Zoom open, I can't. Oh, so did you start Zoom after you start the screen with capture? Because I can't get the webcam to to transition to Canvas Studio after I open up Zoom. Oh, so I'm using Screencast-O-Matic, but I. Oh, okay. So I don't. Maybe it's a problem with. Yeah, because it's like you it's like my can't camera. have your webcam open in Zoom and in your screen recorder at the same. Yeah, I can only use one. Right. So I would right. just turn off my video in Zoom. Like I'm okay. only using Zoom as like a, I'm writing on this. It's it's super sketchy, but it works. I haven't tried like toggling the the webcam between the two. So maybe I should try that. But I, I actually don't mind the drawing tools. It was just that one thing where it's like, okay, you have to stop it and then start it again. So I just didn't know if I was maybe not using it right. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. And okay, this is this is off topic. But um, if I would love to have like one of these sessions for anybody who uses Adobe Premiere, because I just got access to that. And then I also need to ask um, Rachel how to get access to the Screencast-O-Matic Pro through CTE because I didn't realize we could do that. Just email Monica. Oh, well, don't make it so easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, like months, like uh, anyway, uh, last year she sent out an email and she just, so I just tell people to email Monica and she said, right, Tasha, you would know too. Yeah, there's, there's still some licenses left, I believe, but it's only for CTE because it's strong workforce funds. I think I qualify, I think. Yeah, you, you qualify, Adrian. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as far as other fancy stuff that Canvas Studio does, I know there's some editing that you can do before you save your recorded video, but once you've saved it, like, that's it, you don't have access to any of those editing tools anymore, and I haven't played around with them much. Is anybody else? Yeah, I do it all the time, actually. I add, like, a caption on the front. I fade in and out if I've stopped um, recording halfway through, but yes, it's so frustrating that once you upload it, you're done. That's it. You know, you have to download it and use another software uh, application to do any more editing if you want to. So I hate that, but the rest of it's great. I have a question. Um, Tasha, when you have students using it for assessment, um, are you providing them with a tutorial? How are you getting them to feel comfortable to actually start using it for the first time? Yeah. I've I found some link to, or I linked to some explanation tutorial that I had. I have to go look for, for exactly what I found. But there was something that was like, you know, here's, you use Canvas Studio, here's the link to it. Um, I did have to make some videos explaining how to put the captions on and also how to embed a Canvas Studio video into the discussion because it turned out a lot of students were like, oh, I'm going to download my video and then upload it to the discussion as a media and then they lose their captions. They're like, the captions aren't working. I'm like, okay, follow these two <laughs> video instructions. And I sent those out to um, Pronto also. So you're all welcome to use those directly for your students if you want. That's a question I'm always having is when do we actually, I mean, I'd love to provide captions all the time, but it's just, you know, when you don't need to, it's like, it just makes life easier. Um, I know for feedback, we don't need to. Now when students post videos, they have to provide captions or is that, I, I don't know what the rules are there. Um, it's an education moment, teaching moment. So you could share with them why it would be really good for them to provide captions on their videos so that it makes it accessible to everybody in the class. So I think Tasha's got a good, um, a good strategy there um, with having students caption stuff, but is it, it's not required if it's not, unless, 
unless you are going to use that example going forward as something for future classes, and then it kind of becomes part of your course curriculum, um, then you'd make, it, it would have to be, be captioned. So I require that students view each other's videos during the course. So I think that means that they do need to be captioned, right? Yeah, I mean, yes, I would say yes, that they are having to view each other's uh, videos, yeah. So the way that I enforce them putting captions on is I refuse to grade their submission until it has captions. It's like, okay, you know, I see that you've got a video, but there's no captions. Go ahead, caption it. Let me know when there's captions. And, you know, like three or four weeks later, if there's still no captions on one or two, I'll relent and grade it. Um, I also have a, a um, turn it in as many times as you want, as late as you need policy. So it's just that they are getting a big delay in feedback if they are refusing to caption. And I'm happy to sit and work with them to help them with captions or do it during office hours as needed. I, I will say that compared to YouTube captions, the Canvas captions are a lot, I find like they put punctuation in, which they may not be, I think they're more accurate personally, but so for students, it should, I guess I'm getting at, it shouldn't be that, it should be easier for students because the captions are better. So hopefully they're not spending a lot of time doing the captions, so. Yeah, I, I just, I, I have a lot of students who don't actually use Canvas Studio. They either just, they give me like, dude, I've had some very odd links, like like to home servers, to um, <laughs> to YouTube. Um, I can't, there's one that makes really cool videos and I forgot what the name of it is, but, I, but one student in particular uses that. And I, I don't know what kind of captioning capability those have. They aren't actually uploading it through um, Canvas Studio, they're usually just providing links. But they can um, upload it to Canvas Studio because I do that like if I'm doing the, the work around, like I need to annotate something, so I'm recording it in Zoom, I'll upload it to Canvas Studio for the captioning. So you could have them do it that way, which I'm sure they still won't do because they'll send you their home server stuff. But <laughs> yeah, can. I mean, it's, it's a workaround. Yeah, I know it's a good idea. If they're doing, um, if they're iOS and users and they have um, Clips is an app on iOS devices. You guys, I think some of you have tried using Clips before that will auto caption. Um, of course, it's also not perfect, but it's another, and it's not necessarily screencasting. I mean, that would be for talking head videos that they're submitting, um, but it's worth a, a, worth a mention that they have that um, of auto caption. Like it's actually real-time captions as you're speaking, so another one to try. It's kind of nice, I think, to um, introduce these tools to students. It's like something to try um, as they make more videos for other classes or going forward in their career. I mean, it, 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 we're, we're building creator, universal design creators, essentially. And so the more that we can help influence that up front, I kind of get excited about that opportunity. Any other questions? Oh, captions are not easy to edit in clips. That's good to know. It's possible, but they make it really weird and it's really easy to like, you have to do it with your thumbs on the touch screen. It's, yeah, it's really easy to delete them all. <laughs> oh yes, I'm remembering some clips videos from you from buddies in the hammock. Oh, now I'm in the hammock. <laughs> It's fun because you can add like stickers and it's really easy to add effects and things. So that's the fun part. And you can do like, I'm not, I don't know how to do video editing at all. And it lets you kind of pretend that you do, so. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open up breakout rooms. So we've got one if you want some help getting started with Canvas Studio. One, if you're ready to record, uh, you're welcome to hang out in this room as well um, and chat about whatever. I'm going to stop the recording now. Seems like a good time to do that. Sounds good.